They don't do anything with paper. <laughs> they don't. No, they don't. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's the software analyzing it. It's not like I can do 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 it.
program at the agency that specifically deals with chloride. But I've been working with groundwater and um, stormwater related land use related issues for 27 plus years now. And chloride's been one thing that we've always looked at. So I do know something about it. And I thought maybe, well, it'd be nice to kind of take a little different perspective and look at this question about do we have a problem in our water system with chloride um, from somebody who maybe doesn't have a stake in the game. So yeah, we do hear a lot about it. You see it in the news all the time. And at my agency, the Pollution Control Agency, it's risen up on the top uh, few uh, priority list for um, issues that we're going to be looking at. So obviously some people think it is, we do have a problem in our water. So do we have a problem? Yes. <laughs> Thank you, and are there any questions? <laughs> All right, I got a couple slides, actually 48 to be exact. <laughs> but this is the fifth one already. So. Uh, so just real quickly, a little bit about chloride. You probably already know all this stuff, but it's always good to kind of give a little bit of a background. Real big picture look from a state perspective uh, at our waters. And I'm going to take a closer look at some urban areas um, because that's really where the issue is, if there is an issue. I'm not going to answer the question yet because that's got to come at the end of the talk, of course. And then a wrap up. Let, let me ask. Yes. Just comment. Now, you say you don't work in chloride, but the reason I invited you is because you're working with a group on those white paper chloride. So I figure you do know quite a bit about chloride from that activity. And maybe I. Stolen some of your speech by I was that. I was going to mention that group later, but yeah, and and, and so now that John let's has let the cat out of the bag, uh, there is an interagency group of uh, stormwater and groundwater professionals. Um, the Minnesota Groundwater Association has um, agreed to let us work on preparing a white paper, and the focus of that paper is uh, the effect of stormwater infiltration on groundwater, uh, chloride and groundwater. And I actually will be talking later this month at my agency. And so if there's anybody interested in that, I can forward John that information um, and you can tap into that via WebEx. And of course, you're welcome to come there physically too. But anyways, there is this interagency group that's looking specifically at stormwater infiltration and effects on groundwater. Um, and yeah, I do know a little bit about chloride. So over the years. Um, so some real basic stuff, you all know this, it doesn't easily precipitate, it's not biodegradable, it's not involved in um, biological processes, it doesn't absorb significantly into geologic materials, and therefore it's assumed to move readily with water. In the state currently, there are three major sources of chloride. The first and the big purple one, 42%, that is from de-icers or road salt. Um, wastewater treatment plants in the top blue in the upper corner, uh, right corner, um, uh, wastewater treatment plants and that's um, both discharges from, uh, um, from uh, wastewater treatment plants and also from water softening. And so that's primarily an outstate area issue. And then in the lower right, uh, we're looking at fertilizers, which are about 23%. Again, that's more of a rural issue too. So in urban areas, it's really that purple area that we're concerned about, that 42% that's associated with de-icers. Is that salt or chlorine? I'm looking at fertilizer in particular. That's, that's chloride. This is chloride. What? That's chloride contributions. And this is the work that Alicia Overpo is working on right now. Here. What is chloride and fertilizer? Potassium chloride. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay, okay. There are standards for chloride in our waters, aquatic life standards. Uh, there's a chronic standard of 230. And there's an acute toxicity standard of 860, and you can see the basis for those two. And I did dig into the EPA documentation. Uh, it's really, anybody has insomnia, I can send you the link to that. Um, there is also a human consumption criteria based on a salty taste, and that's a secondary maximum contaminant level of 250 parts per million. There are other environmental concerns. I'm not going to go into any depth on any of these today because I'm focused on water. But these other ones certainly um, can be an issue. Uh, toxicity in plants uh, can be a concern for sensitive plants. Uh, foliar damage to plants, and you've all seen that if you're driving on highways and you see vegetation that's damaged from salt applications. Increased metal mobility, that's a bit of a complex topic. 
Um, in doing this, I did a little bit of research, certainly nothing similar to what I would have done 27 years ago as a grad student here, but I um, mean, there's some evidence that chloride complexes with zinc and cadmium, but in most cases, for most metals, if there is increased mobility, it's usually associated with ion exchange with the cation that's associated with chloride. And of course, there's uh, chloride corrodes steel and reduces nitrification, denitrification rates in soil. So I'm going to take a quick look at chloride in our surface water statewide. So if you look at this diagram, and it may be a little bit tough to see, but the red areas are those waters that are impaired. And so they're above the aquatic life toxicity standard. So they're above 230 or above the acute number of 860, I believe it was. Um, and I, there are a few outstate, but obviously you can see that the main concern is going to be in the metro area. And so you can see the lakes show up here now as the little circles. And especially in that urban core area in St. Paul, Minneapolis, that's where we've got the bulk of the impairments. Uh, the orange ones are waters that are considered to be at high risk, and I'll explain what that means later um, in a couple slides. But you can see that the core area certainly has a lot of impairments. In groundwater, it's much the same story. Now, this is a little bit biased towards urban sampling because the data is coming from the MPCA. We focus our sampling mostly on urban areas, but there is enough rural um, outstate coverage here to, to just give a story. And again, you see that the red areas, which are above the standard of 250, are pretty much focused in urban, urban areas. Um, anything that's in blue or green is below 25 or below 75 parts per million. And so we really don't see much chloride um, in outstate areas. It is above background levels, um, but it's not nearly at levels of concern. And this is in shallow, shallow sand and gravel aquifers, I should point out. In deeper bedrock aquifers, we're really not seeing much of a problem yet. We're seeing some elevated numbers. I'm not sure what the one in, down in Rochester, what the issue is with that one that actually exceeds the criteria. But in general, you can see that the numbers are below 75 parts per million. Remembering that the standard is 250. So just real quickly, a summary. Statewide, we have 26 lakes that are impaired as of 2018, 24 streams that are impaired as of 2018, and we haven't nearly assessed all the water bodies. So the numbers may not seem daunting at this point, but they're, um, they're certainly going up, and I'll show some trend data here in a little bit too. Um, we have 120 lakes that are classified at risk. Now risk is based on the presence of one or more samples in the past 10 years with chloride concentration at 90% or more of the standard. So it's not based on any vulnerability of the water body. It's based on an actual concentration that's measured, which is a little bit odd to me, but that's OK. In the Twin Cities metro, of those 26 lakes, 23 of them are in the Twin Cities metro area. 17 lake streams are impaired in the metro, 38 lakes classified at risk. And so about 11% of lakes, uh, uh, surface water bodies in the metro are impaired right now. About 30% of the shallow monitoring wells and sand and gravel aquifers are above the 250 part per million standard. Look at some trends real quick. Um, we don't have real good trend data out state, unfortunately. Um, but we do have some data for trends in the metro area, and you'll see that nearly all the lakes, or all of the lakes, in fact, have upward trends in chloride concentrations. Uh, the darker the red, the faster the rate of increase. So the, the legend is the percent increase. And so the darkest red, we're looking at a 4 to 8% increase in chloride annually. So that's a pretty steep increase in chloride. Um, and again, those, those really Rapidly rising trends are, again, primarily in the urban core area. Um, outstate, about 14 out of 45 lakes are showing upward trends. If we look at the major rivers, this data is coming from the Met Council. Again, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of good trend data for smaller streams or streams outstate. So we're looking primarily at the big water bodies. So the Mississippi, the Minnesota, and the St. Croix. And it's hard to see those numbers, but the Mississippi, for, they're all increasing except for Fort Snelling, uh, the Minnesota at Fort Snelling. And 
the numbers look daunting. So we're looking at increases of on the order along the Mississippi on the order of 40 to 50, 60 percent, and the St. Croix on the order of 100 percent increases since 1985. Those seem big, but then when you look at the concentrations, not so big. St. Croix, we're below 10 parts per million in the surface water. So um, it's still relatively clean water. Even the Mississippi, um, just below the confluence with the Minnesota, is at 36 parts per million, which is well below the standard of 230 parts per million. So yes, there are upward trends in these rivers, and I'm not saying it's not a concern, but um, the concentrations still are at levels that are relatively low. And if you have questions along the way, feel free to jump in. In groundwater, we have upward trends in 11 of 36 <coughs> wells in, in shallow sand and gravel aquifers, and those occur again in urban areas. And the rate of increase in these wells on average is about 3.4, about 3.5 parts per million per year. Some wells are showing much steeper um, increases than that. So I'm going to take a little closer look at urban areas because that's really where the, the issues are. Hopefully you got that message from the slides that I've been showing. So what's what's the issue? And obviously it's going to be de-icers, road salt that has chloride in it. And if you look at the use of the chlor of chloride um, based de-icers, uh, you can see that it's gone up pretty steadily, jumped up significantly in the 90s when we went from a sand salt mix to almost pure sand salt, which is what we're using right now. And the levels maybe have kind of leveled off now, but we're looking at 15 to 20 million tons of de-icer applied annually in the United States. So if you're putting de-icer on an impermeable surface to obviously keep it safe, then that impermeable surface, when the snow melts or it rains, so the salt's going to get washed into a receiving water or in some cases, it may go into a stormwater practice and infiltrate into the ground. So to understand problems are, that might exist in our surface waters, we have to take a look at the concentrations in the runoff because that's where the salt is starting. It's on the street, something it melts, it rains, and then the chloride is transported to the receiving water. And so if we look at these numbers, the red line shows the maximum concentrations in stormwater runoff, and the um, blue shows the median. There's a lot of data out there. I just happened to choose this study from Granado and Smith in 99 because I think this portrays a good graph. We're looking, we're looking at a, the y-axis is a logarithmic scale, so keep that in mind. So in the wintertime, we're looking at concentrations as high as 10, 12,000 parts per million in stormwater runoff, an average concentration of about 1,000 or at least several hundred parts per million. That concentration comes down through the spring, but it's still somewhat elevated, not nearly at those levels, but it's still somewhat elevated because there's some residual chloride left up in the system that needs to get washed through. And then by June or so, we're back down to um, steady levels. Yep. Can you just give me a little spatial context as to where these data points are being gathered from? Is this in, a, in one of these rivers, or is this? This is an actual runoff, stormwater runoff. On, off of an impermeable surface. Is that what you're asking? Yeah, yeah. so it's, it's, it's in stormwater. It's in stormwater, yep. Okay. So this is actually concentrations in, in the stormwater. <clears throat> Digging in a little bit deeper, this study by um, Ryan Winston shows that in areas, so this is the outside of the de-icer season. So during the icer season, we've got these large concentrations of chlorine. <laughs> if we look outside of the de-icer season, so it starts here in May, you're comparing an area, so this is again in stormwater runoff. You're comparing the runoff concentrations in areas that have high de-icer application in the winter to those that don't have de-icer application. And so even in those areas, um, even during the summer when we're not applying salt, we're still seeing elevated concentrations of chloride. The numbers are quite a bit lower, but we're still at 100 parts per million, which is you know, a fairly significant amount. And again, I'm assuming, and I don't know this for sure, but it's logical that there must be some residual chloride up in the system that's moving through. We know the chloride does get hung up in the soil. John showed that in some of his work in his infiltration systems. Um, so, um, and I think Bill Herbst has shown some of that work too in ditches that he's worked in. So there is stuff getting washed out through the summer yet. 
by the climate impact of the area, contributing area, watershed area, the contributing area on the river. Um, the storm water is one square mile of contributing area, ten square miles. I'm not sure how to answer that. What what I would think logically is it's mostly going to be a function of <clears throat> the amount of salt that's being applied, the continent, the connectedness of the impermeable surfaces, and then um, the area may come into play with the delivery times and delivery amounts and so forth. If you have large areas, maybe if you have a lot of chloride up, you might not see some of that chloride wash through until later. I was thinking of spaghetti junction. You're going to have a lot more salt going. Oh, I see. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's the, the concentration, and I'll show some of that data later that the, the most important factors um, contributing to this are exactly what you might expect, which is road density. Um, high, high. The high density of roads where salt gets applied. So residential areas have a lot of roads, but you don't apply the salt there. So, um, and I'll show some of that data in a little bit. Here. A study that Bill Herb and others recently did um, here in Minnesota, they were looking at a location in Minnesota. I don't remember exactly where it was, but Larry, maybe you do. But uh, okay, 90% of the chloride load came through with 16% of the annual runoff volume. So. Think about that for just a second. So almost 100% of our chloride is coming through during this short window in the winter time. And so that, as, a, as stormwater managers and practitioners, that's what we got to be looking at. Is, well, what do we do about that, if anything? So let's take a little closer look at lakes. I'm going to look at lakes, streams, and groundwater. I'm going to ask the same <coughs> questions. What factors makes a lake vulnerable to to chloride contamination, and then what are the consequences of high chloride concentrations in lakes? Because even if chloride gets there, if, if it doesn't affect anything, then we don't have a problem. This is a little complicated, so I'll walk you through it, and this is, gets at Satish's question, I think. So this is a study that um, several authors um, uh, worked on. Hillary Dugan out of Madison is the primary author, but they looked at several factors, and I'm only showing the two that they found to be important. The first is impervious surface within 500 meters of a receiving water, and these are lakes. And all these lakes are in the northern part of the United States, including many here in Minnesota. And the size of the symbol is representative of the size of the water body of the lake. So the bigger the symbol, the bigger the lake. And the other factor was road density. And so they ran regressions of chloride concentration on a bunch of factors. And these two factors are the two that jumped out. So they ran a regression of chloride concentration on impervious surface. And you can see, except for a few, a handful that, where they found no uh, significant uh, relationship in the gray area off to the left, that all the relationships were positive. So this shows the slopes, and they're all positive slopes. So impervious surface within 500 meters of a lake is the most important factor that they identified in their study. And of course, that's related to road salt application. Road density was also important, but you can see that it's a little bit more mixed, where there actually are some situations where road density wasn't as important. Um, and we actually had some negative um, slopes for some of those. And of course, these are going to be surrogates for application of road salt. It's almost impossible to go out and get very precise data on road salt application, at least currently with the current technology. Maybe, maybe five, ten years from now, we'll be able to get that information. But you could go to the city of St. Paul or Minneapolis, and they could tell you how many tons they're applying uh, per lane mile and stuff like that. But to get it for very specific <coughs> areas is not feasible. So we're looking for these surrogate indicators, and that's what these are here. One interesting thing about this study is that they found that if you had impervious surfaces as low as 1%, that they saw upward trends in chloride concentration. This is from Eric Novotny's study. Um, he worked with Heinz Stefan and others back in, 2000, in the 2000s, and they looked at 13 metro lakes. And again, the left, the uh, y axis is a little bit confusing. It's normalized. So anything above the one means it's high, anything below the one means it's low, basically. 
um, similar to the climate uh, numbers that you see, the global temperature numbers that you oftentimes see. And so you can see that the peaks always occur in mid-March. So these are peak concentrations in lakes. Um, the highest concentrations in runoff are probably with those little melts that we get in January and February. We do have them. I know some of you are saying, what melt is he talking about? <laughs> but we do get little melts um, in January and February, and those have extremely high concentrations of chloride. But on a volume and mass basis, it's really not a lot. When we get that first flush melt that we're going to get next week, right? Um, that's when all that road salt that's out there is going to get washed into the lake. And that's why we're seeing these peaks here in March. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Another, another uh, fact, another um, characteristic that was looked at, and this is out of the chloride management plan, which the agency is currently working on, is this, this Osgood index, which looks at the, the ratio of the mean depth of a lake, how deep it is, to the square root of the surface area. So uh, and we get a regression, a correlation coefficient of 0.6, which in the environmental world is really not too bad. Um, and you can see that as that Osgood index increases, Chloride concentration increases, which means a deep lake that's small is going to be very vulnerable to chloride con to chloride um, inputs. Another way of looking at that is to look at the ratio of bottom concentrations in the lake to the top concentration. So you take samples from the lower part of the lake and the upper part of the lake. The one-to-one -one line there, you can see that all the lakes sampled are above the one-to-one -one line. It's not surprising. You expect chloride to move down, you expect to get this saline layer in a lake, and that's exactly what's happening. So is that important? There's lots of studies out there, and I happened to pick this one because I thought it was fairly comprehensive, um, this, and it's fairly recent too, which is good. So looking at the community structure in lakes and the effects that chloride has <coughs> on the community structure, it has a negative impact on zooplankton, and surprisingly, a positive response by phytoplankton. If you look at the benthic communities, it's a mixed result. Some things are negatively affected, some things are unaffected. And I'm not going to go into great detail here, but I can certainly forward any of these references if you're interested. Um, so the bottom line here is that the community structure in lakes is getting disrupted. Another factor is chemical stratification. If you're putting more salt, if you have a saline layer at the bottom of the lake, you're going to really impede the likelihood that that lake's going to turn over. That lake needs to turn over if you're going to have proper nutrient cycling in it. The result then is that we're disrupting the nutrient cycle in, in these lakes. We get this oxygen deficient layer at the bottom, um, and of course that has implications for phosphorus. So we've got a lot of phosphorus problems in our lake. It's getting exacerbated by these chloride inputs because when the lake finally does turn over, you've got this anaerobic um, area at the bottom of the lake and all this dissolved phosphorus is going to get flushed to the top and it's going to cause problems in the lake or if it gets flushed out of the lake, it's going to cause problems downstream somewhere. So let's take a look at rivers and streams. Same questions, what factors make a river or stream vulnerable, and what are the consequences? Start by looking at the Mississippi River. I mentioned earlier there are upward trends in the Mississippi River, but over a 30-year period, it's been about 0.3 milligrams per liter per year. I'm not saying that's not a cause for concern, but it's a pretty low number, and we're still well below 50 parts per million in the river. So there are... There is an upper trend, but it's not a real significant, I hate to use the word significant, so don't use it. It's not a large number. Um, concentrations are greatest in the winter, as you would expect, but again, even in the winter, we're still below 50 parts per million. So looking at the winter, summer, and going into the winter here again. So those are the big rivers. That's a big river. We're going to see some. We would see similar patterns in the Minnesota if I showed that data. But if you look at the smaller streams in, in 
it's going to be a function of the setting. Now, Battle Creek is in a very highly urban area. If you look, these are stream concentrations now. If you look at the stream concentrations, you can see that it's exceeding the aquatic life criteria in the winter. And we're getting numbers over 600 parts per million. So we're starting to approach the acute toxicity standard in this very highly urban lake. Even in the summer, we're still at about 100 parts per million, which is, which is fairly high. If you look at a mixed urban ag land, now we're below the standard, but we're still at about 100 parts per million during much of the year. Just again, and I should emphasize, background concentrations are going to be less than 10 parts per million. That means in forested areas and so forth. If we go to an agricultural setting, now we're down to 15 parts per million or less. So yes, it's these urban, these very highly urban streams where we're encountering concerns. We can a little bit of a complicated graph, and I'll walk you through it. Um, but it tells a story, and a very logical story makes a lot of sense. If you look at the number of days with snowfall, which increases on the x-axis, and we look at chloride concentrations, chloride concentrations go up when we have more snow. And that makes perfect sense because we're putting more salt on during that season. Chloride concentrations are a function of base flow. Miller Creek in Duluth, very flashy system. Very, very small, if any, base flow contribution to this, this creek. And you can see in the wintertime, a peak concentration of 1,400 parts per million in this creek. You notice the three purple dots. Those are snow melt concentrations. These are concentrations in the runoff. And you can see that they fall right on the concentration line for the creek. The creek is essentially stormwater runoff. So street, a, a creek without base flow component is going to be very vulnerable in the wintertime, not so much in the summertime. If we look at a different situation, Bassett Creek in Minneapolis, which does have a large base flow component, we are above the standard in the winter, but now we're at about 300, 350 parts per million in the wintertime. In the summer, we're below the standard, but we're still above 100 parts per million. So the groundwater, which I mentioned earlier, which is getting loaded with chloride, is now migrating and keeping that concentration high throughout the year in that stream. So, so what are the consequences of high chloride? So this data, again, is fairly recent. Um, I'm going to show a couple different data sets. There's a ton of data out there on this, and it's a little bit mixed. Um, in this study, they began seeing some minor negative impacts about, at about 150 parts per million. Um, they noticed that stream bank vegetation was changed, but not nutrient cycling. So nutrient cycling was not disrupted, at least in this particular study. In this study, they, they saw some disruption in some of the more sensitive in, insects at about 240 parts per million, which is very close to that standard of 230. And this Maryland study is pretty comprehensive. Is there anybody here not familiar with the index of biological indicator criteria? Okay. So it's basically going out and collecting an assemblage of organisms in a water body and assessing the health of the water body based on what assemblage should be there and what's actually there. And so the higher the IBI, the healthier the aquatic community. The lower the IBI, the poorer the, the community. And in Maryland, they began seeing that the benthic biologic community was starting to get affected at about 190 parts per million. And at 600 or 500 parts per million, there was impairment in all water bodies. With fish, it's a little bit of a mixed bag, but uh, the greatest effects on fish appear to be in their early life stages, including the larval stage. Despite considerable information, the results are really mixed. And um, I'm not sure, maybe there's an ecologist in the room here that could explain that, but I got the sense in reading this, and I'm not an aquatic biologist, I got the sense that stream communities all are very different, they're very complex. The water is there for a short period of time and flushes through. So it's a little more complex system, and I think that maybe that's part of the reasoning here. But I would suggest to talk to your local aquatic biologist if you have questions about that. 
So let's take a look at groundwater. Same questions. What makes it sensitive and what are the consequences? So this study is from the USGS in 2009. If you look at the land uses, again, we got a log scale on the y-axis. So you're comparing forested areas, and agricultural areas, and urban areas. And we're looking at median concentrations in forested areas of maybe one, two, three parts per million. In urban areas, which is significantly greater than the other two, we're looking at concentrations 50 parts per million or greater, and some very high numbers too. This um, graph shows the chloride to bromide ratios, which is the tool we use to de determine the source of the chloride. So chloride to bromide ratios of 1,000 or more are indicative of road salt. And you can see that that's right about where we're at in urban areas. And we're not there with the other two settings. So in urban areas, that's where the salt's coming from. It's from road salt. Where does the bromide come from? Uh, there's some natural bromide out there in the system, and I, it's probably in the rocks, I assume, or something like that. Um, any geologists here that would? Yeah, question? Yeah, back in the, uh, the previous slide, um, Larry sent me a study recently um, indicating the uptake of bromide by vegetation. Um, at a rate much higher than it could take up chloride. And I wonder how much that conflicts with um, the assessment that forests have a lower ratio. It's a good question. Is that uh, sounds like a good research project to me. <laughs> and I don't know the answer to that. Um, back when I defended for my prelims, I made the mistake of uh, trying to answer a question that I couldn't answer. And I really got knocked on the head. Thanks, John. <laughs> um, so uh, I don't know the answer to that, but it's an intriguing question. If it's significant, then maybe some of the assumptions we've been making all these years are, would need to be adjusted a little bit. So. This is some data from the PCA. Um, and PCA is, re is working up its latest data, but this is from 2013. And I've been told that the numbers are somewhat similar, so um, I went ahead and decided to use this instead of pushing to get the newer data. But the yellow, I mean, the blue shows median concentrations, and the orange shows maximum concentrations, comparing commercial industrial, sewered residential, residential with septic systems, agriculture, and then undeveloped areas. And you can see that the median concentrations are significantly higher in, in uh, urban areas. And not just in urban areas, but in commercial industrial areas, they're the highest, about 82 parts per million in shallow groundwater. This is, again, shallow groundwater samples. Um, but in urban areas in general, it's always above undeveloped and agricultural settings. <clears throat> so this study by Mullaney, <clears throat> excuse me, they looked at several um, factors and tried to run regressions on them, and they only found significant regressions for two. One was potential evapotranspiration, which I just wasn't going to discuss because it's not a Minnesota related issue. Um, but major road density was one where they found a significant uh, correlation. And again, that's very similar to what we saw with the lake study that um, I showed earlier by Dugan. They looked at all these other factors, and none of them were significant. Um, highway connector, major highway density. Highway density, local road density, percent residential, commercial, industrial, <coughs> population density, or season. So major road density was the only factor that they came up with. And so what we're trying to do is identify what are those factors that are going to make groundwater sensitive to contamination by chloride. Just real quickly to look at the seasonal effect, this is some work that I did back with the agency in the late 90s. And you can see that winter, spring, summer, fall concentrations in the Right at the top of the water table, these wells are right screened right at the top of the water table. There's no seasonal effect. And I found that a little surprising at the time. I thought, well, for sure, chloride concentrations are going to be higher in groundwater uh, in the wintertime, but they're not, or in the early spring, but they're not. And there's a reason for that. And John would know the reason his work, some of his work shows it, but there is a delay in chloride moving through the soil profile, or in the case of an infiltration practice, through an infiltration practice. So the chloride is getting hung up 
to some extent. So it's still conservative, but not as conservative as maybe we've been thinking all along, all through all these years. We can actually use that, and I'm going to talk a little bit about stormwater infiltration. We can use that information to our advantage if we're going to manage for chloride. So intuitively, you would think the most vulnerable areas are going to be places where you've got shallow groundwater and permeable soils. Urban areas are really complex. Many, many chloride sources. We've got all kinds of leaky pipes underneath uh, the system. We've got stormwater infiltration practices. We have impermeable surfaces that are very permeable, as you'll find out the next time you drive through a pothole. Um, we've got pervious surfaces. We've got stormwater infiltration practices. We've got ponds out there, stormwater ponds, that are leaking. So just to assume that all we've got to do is map the places where we have sensitive um, ge geology, and that's where it's going to be vulnerable. That's not the case. It's very complex. And so part of this group that I'm working with right now, with this interagency group on this white paper, um, we, were, we found some good studies on the hydrology of urban areas, but we didn't find any studies that looked at chloride loading from many different sources. So we, we made some sim simplifying assumptions about the amount of water that's coming through these, those different sources that I showed in the previous slide and the chloride concentrations that are in those sources. And that data was out there. And so if you throw that data together, you come up with a chart that looks like this. And so this would be from a typical residential area where we're getting very little application, if any, of de-icer. And so only about 40% is actually directly infiltrating, like through lawns and, and uh, green spaces and so forth. A fair amount is coming through these other sources. Um, and this would, this would assume that there's stormwater infiltration practices like rain gardens and so forth. So we're getting about 13% through that, about 14% through stormwater ponds, and of course this depends on the system. If you don't have ponds there, they're not going to be contributing, but this is just kind of a, a ballpark look at it. So there's many, many different sources of chloride in our groundwater. Yep? This was produced for this white paper? This yes, paper? yep. And actually we will be looking at a bunch of different scenarios. What we're interested in is this stormwater infiltration piece. I'm going to talk a little bit about it um, in a minute here. But that's what we're really interested in. And so in this white paper, we ran several different scenarios um, with the amount of stormwater infiltration that's occurring and where it's occurring. Is it occurring in areas with high de-icer application rates and low de-icer application rates? And that's the stuff that I'll be um, presenting on later in the white paper we'll be talking about. Um, so we have high chloride in groundwater and shallow groundwater. Is that a problem? Um, well, it can certainly affect urban streams that are have a high uh, significant base flow contribution. Shallow and sand aquifers are at risk in core urban areas. Is this a concern? There are a few groundwater receptors and, and I suppose there's some folks at my agency that would probably come up and great, put a gag on me right now, but um, there aren't many groundwater receptors in the core urban area. And we're looking at salty taste as the end product here. And you compare that to aquatic toxicity. And I'm not making any judgments here one way or the other. But are we comparing apples and apples here, or are we comparing apples and oranges? Um, so and I'm going to leave that to you to decide. I'm not saying we should load up our groundwater with chloride. But if push comes to shove, we have to make decisions. What's that decision going to be? What about deeper drinking out of water aquifers? <coughs> well, you're all probably familiar with the geology of the Twin Cities Metro. So we've got some unconsolidated drift on top of these layered Paleozoic um, uh, bedrock layers, some of which are aquifers and some of which are aquitards. And if you look at the Twin Cities Metro area, which is shown in the red rectangle here, it's the darker blue area here where the Prairie du Chien, which is our primary drinking water aquifer, is most vulnerable. And so those are going to be the areas where we might be concerned about our chloride levels getting into the deeper drinking water system. The other areas to the north of that have some aquifer protection. And I'm not saying let's go ahead and load, load that shallow groundwater up because it's not going to get in the deeper system, but there is some protection up there. 
The problem is that we don't have the data for these deeper systems right now. We don't have data that shows what those concentrations are, and we certainly aren't even close to having trend data at this point. Just a sidebar, I, didn't look, I did not look at wetlands, um, but many wetland species, such as amphibians, are more sensitive to chloride. Um, so I didn't have, and you'll see a, a bullet later that maybe explains why I didn't look at wetlands. But. So do we have a chloride problem? So I'm concerned about chloride in lakes. Um, I think we're, this, what I showed earlier is we're, we're upsetting the, the fundamental community structure in these lakes, plus we're potentially exacerbating the problem that we, we know we already have with phosphorus. And the problem with a lake too is the residence time. So the stuff gets in there, it's gonna take a while to get that stuff out of there. Out of there. So I, I do have some concerns about urban lakes. I think there's enough to say that we should be concerned about urban streams, but <coughs> fundamentally, urban streams are so messed up hydrologically that that's a bigger problem in my mind than chloride. Until we get the hydrology fixed in these systems, I think chloride is, I'm not saying it's not important, but we, we really need to focus on getting the hydrology of these systems fixed first. I'm concerned about deeper aquifers, but only because we don't know anything about them. Um, I think if we can get some data and start getting some good trend data, and we're, we're starting to, to realize that we need that, then I think we can start taking a look at these deeper aquifer systems. The good news is that I wouldn't expect, if we're gonna see trends, positive trends, the good news is I wouldn't expect those curves to be real steep for the deeper aquifer system. Wetlands likely would be significant concern, but is there such a thing as a functional wetland in an urban area? So, a uh, little bit of cynicism there. I'm sure there are, but again, that kind of relates to the stream issue. Though. You really messed the hydrology in these urban areas up. A lot of these wetlands were actually used as stormwater for stormwater treatment for a long time. I only have one slide on management strategies, but I was talking to Larry about before the talk about this. This is a really complex issue. And of course, the first thing we should do is decrease our use of the icers to acceptable rates. Um, there's a lot of places, and all you need to do is walk down the sidewalk and, and see that we're applying way too much salt. Um, there are proper rates. Um, Brooke Oslison at the agency is working with uh, folks like Connie Fortin and that to do a lot of training, and the road people are starting to get get it. The road people are starting to get it. Private applicators, not so much. Um, so that's number one on the list. But there's a whole bunch of other strategies we should be thinking about too. Um, maybe use alternatives. And I put maybe because you'll see that's one of my research suggestions. I don't think we can go to um, something like acetate until we know what the potential effects of that are going to be on the environment. So we still have work to do in that area. Use liquids, anti-ice, um, and you'll see maybe today, hopefully, they'll go out and they'll do some anti-icing in lieu of yet another winter storm tomorrow. So this is a very efficient way of decreasing your salt application. Establish chloride-free zones around sensitive water bodies. Improved snow and ice removal technology. And I was talking to Larry about this before. We're starting to see some technology now where the snow blades can actually get, really do a great job of getting that snow and that ice off the pavement. If you can do that, then you don't need to apply the icer or you need to apply much less. So the technologies, uh, I think, are starting to get there um, where we can do a better job of removing the snow and the ice. Lower the wintertime speeding limits. And then infiltrate in the right locations, especially with permeable pavements. Permeable pavements, as many of you probably realize, um, need very little, if any, de-icer. Um, they can't be used everywhere. I-94 is not going to be constructed of permeable pavements, but they're perfectly suitable for parking lots, sidewalks, um, maybe light traffic roadways. The technology is getting better, but we're not there with heavy use yet. And it was disappointing several years ago when I was walking by McAllister College, they put in these really beautiful permeable pavements, and then they put the icer on them in the wintertime. And I've noticed that they stopped doing that. Somebody must have told them about it. 
if I have enough time, do I have a few minutes yet? I'm going to talk a little bit about stormwater infiltration because that's an area that I work in. Um, it's a little bit of a side sideway bend here, but um, <clears throat> so for those of you who are not familiar with the concept of infiltration, it's the latest rage. Uh, green infrastructure, low impact development. Um, and the reason is, is we want to keep the water as close to its source as possible. Um, so what we do is we build these systems that are designed to capture runoff in the street, hold the water and infiltrate it into the underlying uh, soil where it eventually will get into the groundwater system and from there maybe into the deeper aquifer or into a local stream or lake. These systems are focused recharge systems. They'll, uh, depending on the design, they'll take 25, 30, 50, 60 feet of water a year, which is much, much greater than the typical infiltration that we see, of uh, maybe about 4 to 10, 12 inches in some places maybe. So they're designed to focus a lot of water. And of course, that might raise a red flag if you've got really high chloride concentrations in that water. And you compare that to other systems that have this underdrain, well, they're, they're capturing the water too, and they're filtering it, but that filtered water then gets captured by this underdrain and gets returned to the stormwater system. So they're not infiltrating very much water. Some water does escape below. So it's these infiltration systems on the left here that we're, we're, we're concerned with. And some examples, rain garden here on the left, underground infiltration, permeable pavements on the lower right, the tree trench system along the green, green wind, um, that's a massive underground infiltration system. So I'll walk you through this study. Um, and there's been a number of good studies. John's been working on one here in the metro. But this is, this is a very good study that's done out of Villanova. And so I'll try to walk you through it. So they looked at a rain garden, an infiltration system, and they uh, outfitted it. So they measured the concentration of runoff coming into the rain garden. And they measured the concentration in the rain garden and in three lysimeters that were at depths of 0, 4, and 8 feet below the rain garden. Then the water table, which is about 20 feet down, they put a monitoring wall directly down gradient of this rain garden. And then farther down, 35 feet, <coughs> is another monitoring well. So I'll walk you through this data now. So during the de-icer season, we're looking at concentrations of up to 10,000 parts per million coming in. This is the runoff coming in to the rain garden. So concentrations are very high. And as, as I showed earlier, they drop off pretty, pretty significantly and quickly in the spring. Looking at the lysimeters, even the lysimeters right at the bottom of that rain garden, constant, again, we've got a log scale here, concentrations are significantly lower, but still quite high. So we're looking at concentrations on the order of maybe three, four hundred parts per million in these lysimeters, but not 10,000 parts per million. If you look at the monitoring well, directly down gradient, you see an even lower concentration. But you also notice that the lysimeters have this lag time when the concentration stays very high way after the de-icer season has ended. The monitoring well is in an even further lag. So the chloride is taking its time getting through the system and down gradient. And if you look at the monitoring well down gradient, it's not impacted at all by this system. That can have important implications for how we manage infiltration. So here's some stormwater infiltration recommendations. Infiltrate in areas not vulnerable to chloride contamination. These are great areas to infiltrate. We want to, we want to infiltrate residential areas, places like that. We want to infiltrate there, really promote it. If you're in vulnerable areas, maybe distribute your infiltration practices. Use multiple rain guards instead of one system. Properly cite your infiltration practices with respect to receiving our water. So thinking about that previous slide, if we're seeing a six month lag in that peak concentration in groundwater from an infiltration practice, maybe put your infiltration practice a travel time of six months away from your receiving water. So it's about placement. 
a little bit complicated. We don't get that sophisticated in stormwater, but maybe we need to start thinking about things like that. And then utilize permeable pavements when it's appropriate to do that. These are just some needs that I've identified. Um, I'm sure you're all working in the world of research and, you, and I've heard a couple ideas today already of some things that might be nice, nice work to do. Um, we need to do, uh, we need to start looking at our trend data. Met Council is starting to do this with the smaller streams um, in the metro area. We need, we need that data to help us understand what's going on in these urban streams. We need to improve our understanding of fate and transport in groundwater. Uh, we need to map vulnerable areas. So going back, it's not going to be just those areas that are geologically sensitive, but it's going to be those areas where we have a high density of roads where we're seeing this de-icer application. And that's one of the recommendations we're going to make in this paper is it would be, be really nice if we had these vulnerability maps uh, showing these areas. Once you've identified, enhance your monitoring in those areas so that you can see what's happening. And we need to beef up our deeper, our monitoring and our deeper aquifer system. And we're headed in that direction. The problem, of course, is it's not cheap. Drilling deep wells is very expensive. It's hard to get approvals sometimes. And you need, generally, you need a lot of years of data. Improve our understanding of impacts in lakes. Study the chloride dynamics in these lakes. And there's work being done on that now. So we're starting to look at that, what's happening in these lakes, especially with respect to, to stratification. And then the ecological effects, I think we need to look at that also. Phosphorus dynamics, uh, we have many, many phosphorus impaired lakes, and they're not going to get better if we're adding on chloride to these lakes. And identify those high value waters that are at risk. We need more research on chloride alternatives. So my final thoughts, continue to focus on reductions. I mean, that's obviously we have to step number one. We gotta, we gotta cut back on the amount we're, we're using. But let the science play out. Um, I don't get completely disturbed when I see these articles in the newspaper, but you know, I'm, I'm a scientist by nature and I always, I always cringe a little bit when you see people jumping on a bandwagon, and I'm not saying that chloride is not a concern. I think we just need to let the science play out a little bit here yet, too, before we start jumping to conclusions about things. Unless we find an alternative to chloride-based deicers, we're going to have to accept some impairments. There's just no way around it. Um, we have to balance road safety. We're not going to stop roads, you know, stop protecting our drivers on the roads. And if that's going to be the case, then we're going to continue to use chloride. We're going to have to, some waters are going to end up being impaired. And that's just the way it is. And we're not going to be able to do anything about that. So at this point, I'll take some questions. My contact information is here. You can talk to John. Um, but just some other folks that, um, you, if you're interested in any of the work, Brooke Oslison is our person who's working really hard on getting people to um, implement good salt management strategies. John Gulliver at the university is doing some work, as Larry has found out today, too. Um, Bill Herb and all those guys work together. Andy in the back. Um, Hillary Dugan out of the University of Madison is doing work. Lots of work on permeable pavement, a couple of contacts there. So, are there any questions at this point? Sorry. Yeah. So uh, in the uh, watershed commissioner, the Shingle Creek watershed, for quite a while, I have a couple observations. First of all, um, Shingle Creek has a TMDL for chloride. So there's absolutely no leeway whatsoever for the you know Shingle Creek watershed that there's a law that says we have to work on strategies to reduce that chloride concentration below the TMDL. So, I mean, I like the caveats you were bringing up at the end, but practically speaking, you know, the, the, the real issue is for a lot of small urban communities, we, we have no resources to deal with um, the cost of remediating watersheds or impaired. So what do we do about that? 
Yeah, and I also work for the stormwater program, which is a permitting program at the agency. And um, there may come a time where there's this thing out there that uh, is called maximum extent practicable. And basically what it says, if, if a permittee has done everything that's with, within reason and they still can't get to an endpoint, that they're done. And we may push that on this particular issue. I, you know, I'm having a hard time seeing how Shingle Creek is ever going to be below that aquatic life standard. Um, if we continue to use chloride, you can put a lot of strategies. You can have all the road authorities doing the right things and so forth. And I think you're still probably going to be above the standard. And at that point, the ball kind of gets thrown back into my agency's court saying, you know, we've done everything. We're not going to get there. And at that point, we may just say, yes, you've done everything and we're not going to get there. So I don't know if that doesn't really give you a satisfactory answer, maybe, but. Uh, no. um, we have been doing a lot of good things, including the permeable pavement has worked an amazing uh, reduction. You don't have to use salt at intersections. Yeah. But we have, you know, major highways that go through our, our watershed, and MnDOT is just a whole other ballpark. Yeah. And MnDOT's doing a great job um, there, but they still have to put the ice around the roads. And so, I mean, until we come up with reasonable alternatives to chloride, I don't see how some of these waters are not going to stay impaired. I just, I'm having, it's just the way it is. I think Andy had a question first, and then. That's all right. Um, so I think I have the answer to this, uh, but I think from you know, Alicia's work, it just came out. Something like 23% of uh, the chloride from ag, right? Fertilizers, yeah. Yeah, and then, but then when you looked at the, the stream data and the groundwater data in the ag areas, the chloride concentrations were really, really low. So it didn't seem like there was a, there was a connection there. Whereas in the urban areas, you certainly saw a connection between what was being applied into the chloride and then the impacts on the waters. Mm -hmm. and I don't know if that's Connection just hasn't been made yet, or if we need to look more into that. I don't know if you've heard anything. I suspect it might be an area issue because you've yeah. got the area <coughs> that you're applying that 22%, 23% over is much, much larger than the area that you're applying that 43% road salt or whatever it is over. So I, I suspect that has something to do with it. But good trend data would help us to understand that better, too. Right. So I think Larry you had a question. Well, uh, you mentioned the groundwater uh, contamination of base flow. Mm -hmm. uh, in the big drains of several of them, at least in the Capital Region Watership District. Uh, uh, I mentioned that they gave us a lot of their data to work with. I've been Jackie uh, doing a lot of statistical stuff. The, uh, there, there is uh, chloride in the summer that exceeds the 234 standard in some of those drains. So it's clearly groundwater coming in. Yeah. Um, and I think the hang up is just the trains that are coming down to the bay of the zone. In the groundwater itself, but uh, as it drains out, there are very high concentrations, and uh, that's true, I believe, too. In uh, I'm trying to remember from that I saw today uh, in some of the uh, NWL areas. Yeah, and I should have qualified my statement that about base flow, um, how you can use that as a way to manage a stream. If your groundwater is above the aquatic standard, it isn't going to do you any good in the stream. So yeah, and there are you're right, there are places where groundwater is above 230. So um, that's not going to help the stream at all. So I've, I've got just a little bit of quick clarification and maybe a short follow up. It's just um, it, during parts of your presentation, I wasn't sure if you were saying, suggesting that chloride as it moves through the soil profile is moving slower than the water is transporting it. Um, or it, we're not sure what's right. happening yet. Um, there could be some dead pore spaces. There could be some chlorination reactions happening with organic matter. Um, we're not sure exactly why the chloride is getting held up yet. My follow up was the mechanism. That would be a good. That would be a good study, and that's actually one of the recommendations we're going to make in this paper is to try to get. If we're putting in these infiltration systems, we're putting in a lot of chloride. A lot of these are really have fairly high organic matter content, content to them. Yeah. You know what? What are the dynamics of chloride in these systems? Yeah. So. Yeah. 
and we don't we really don't know. I, uh, uh, most of what you're talking about here is correct for understanding chloride uh, better for you guys and such. But uh, we can do a lot more research on the on reducing the inputs in a way that uh, are more targeted toward a particular uh, winter event uh, that uh, we use the, the right amount and no more. Uh, we have these uh, computerized soft trucks. We have a lot of data now, a lot of uh, big drains now uh, being monitored all year round. Um, you know, we have obviously the weather data and that stuff. We can start to put together that management concept uh, and research and growth and do a quick thing with it, that's for sure. But I think we can do more. I mean, we're sitting with these. You know, two hundred thousand dollar computerized trucks, and nobody's using the data. And we're starting to do it in the diet. They're, they're kind of happy to see us there, I think. Uh, but uh, in the past, up till very recently, we haven't been using that data. It's it's there for us. I think that gets at the bullet I made about letting the science play out. I mean, yeah. there's a lot of data out there, and I think we need to look at that data and let the. I, I get a sense from NPCA. Uh, when this isn't directed at you. But uh, the idea is just let's just cut back, cut back, cut back. And there's not a social science part of that. Like, how much can you cut back before people are, you know, feeling impaired and taking the mobility? Uh, or some old lady slips and breaks her hip because they didn't solve the parking lot. Um, yeah, but so sort of cutting back blindly. If we just cut back a little, if everybody tries harder, we'll get there. And I would suggest that if you target your how we're doing with the worst winter events. We're pretty sure that most chloride is being put down. Uh, we can do a pretty good job uh, doing things like, like you mentioned, like using alternative uh, blade technology, or all kinds of things that we can do that would uh, you know, actually start the reduction process, even as we're learning more about the impacts in such a long way. I think Brooke would agree with you. I've had conversations. But I think she would agree with you. I think you're right. Our agency, and, and that goes way back to my third slide where I showed those news clips. Um, I think yeah. sometimes people see, oh, we've got impairments, we've got bad trends, we got the sky is falling kind of yeah. a thing. And I think you're right. I think there is some of that out there. And that's why I framed this talk after John asked me to come and talk. That's why I framed the talk the way I did. Is I don't think it's a sky is falling issue, but I do think it's something we need to do something about. And I think you're right. I think we need to look at it more holistically. As that cutting back is a, probably the most important thing, but there's a lot of other things we can do too. The other thing I haven't seen is uh, I have not seen a single social science type survey to query the uh, citizens. Uh, what the uh, what they would accept in terms of chloride reduction. And the only time cities hear about it is when somebody's pissed off and they call, you know, because they, they slid into a truck or something. But uh, uh, you know, what would the average citizen? How do they feel about this? Well, they have no idea. It'd be interesting if the liability legislation goes through, and uh, and then people realize that they're not liable anymore and so they start if they if they in fact start putting less salt on as a result of that and then it'd be interesting to see that but you're right I don't ultimately as citizens have to play a role in it too so. yeah I think that uh, uh, Michael you're on the phone a while thank you thank you Thank you. Thank you. Enjoyed it very much. I'm going to close this off here. Okay.